Good morning, my name is Kate Sanner, um, and today I will be talking about Raja Yoga. So I just got back from a month immersion program in Costa Rica to become a yoga trainer. And everyone always asks, what kind of yoga did you learn? And so I learned Raja Yoga, which is really all-encompassing. Um, and basically, Raja Yoga is the royal path of yoga. So a guy named Patanjali created it. It's the eight-line path to enlightenment. So in the next five minutes, I'm going to teach you everything you know, need to know about how to become enlightened. So we start with the yamas. These are the universal moralities. Uh, so the first one is ahimsa, which means nonviolence. Um, and this isn't just not getting in a fight. It's also um, just being mindfully considerate of others and displaying acts of kindness. The next one is satya, which is truthfulness. Um, so truthfulness not only with others, but also with yourself. Then we have asteya, which is non-stealing. Um, and non-stealing is not just taking, not taking someone's physical possession, uh, but one of the things we talked about a lot in Costa Rica was not talking about people behind their back, because in the sense you're stealing their truth. Brahmacharya is moderation. We can all use practice in this in really every aspect of our life specifically beer, or maybe not, in this, in this case. Uh, and then aparigraha is non-possessiveness. So this really means not grasping for things, not grasping for our signing bonus, not grasping for you know, the next promotion, just really being where you are right now and, and recognizing that place in your life. So then we move on to the niyamas, which are personal observances. So this is how you um, interact with yourself. So the first one is saucha, purity and cleansing. Uh, this means, you know, do you take good care of your health? Are you clean? Do you live in an environment that is, um, you know, clean of impurities? Santosha is contentment. Uh, so this kind of is all about, uh, you know, are you accepting where you are now? Or are you always, you know, looking for the next thing? This should be better, that should be better. Or are you really just able to appreciate what you have? Then tapas is discipline. So do you set goals and do you have the discipline and the integrity to see them through? Then svadhyaya. These are all Sanskrit words, so kind of hard to pronounce that. Svadhyaya is self-education. So do you take time for self-reflection? Um, are you able to grow and improve yourself on a daily basis through self-education and study? And then ishvara pradhyana uh, is devotion and surrender. Um, so that's really where the faith comes in, where you are surrendering to a higher being and recognizing that you might not have all of the answers and just having faith that, you know, it will happen eventually if you stay true to yourself. So then we go into the asanas, which are the physical postures. In the Western world, the asanas is really what everyone thinks of as yoga. But you can see from this chart, it's really just a very small portion of what yoga actually is. Um, and so the asanas are just the physical practice, so all of the, the po po postures. Then we go to pranayama, which is breath control. Uh, and breath control is really a way to keep the energy inside of you. And there's a lot of different kinds of breathing techniques that you can use. So the three-part breath is the most basic. So if you guys all want to practice this for a second. So the way that you should properly breathe, and people really don't do this correctly, is it should be a three-part breath. So you should start at your chest, your chest should expand, then your ribs should expand, and then your stomach should rise. And as you exhale, your stomach should contract, your ribs should contract, and your chest should fall. So let's practice that right now. OK, so you can place one hand on your chest, one on your stomach. And you're going to inhale, chest, ribs, belly. Exhale, belly, ribs, chest. And you should be inhaling through the nose, and then exhaling through the nose as well. So that's proper breathing technique. Uh, and when you're doing yoga, if you're not breathing properly, they say you're not really doing yoga at all. You're just working out. Uh, so there's really a big emphasis on the breath. There's also things like alternate nostril breathing, where you end up doing all kinds of weird things with your fingers, and it gets kind of interesting. Um, and then there's lunar and solar breaths, which are heating breaths or cooling breaths. So then we go to Pratyahara, which is controlling the senses. Um, so this is really about withdrawing from external things, uh, and this is really in preparation for meditation. Uh, so you don't want to be distracted by noises or by, you know, a bug flying on you. You really want to be able to just withdraw. And then dharana is deep concentration. So things you can use for this are mantra repetitions. So really just focusing your concentration pretty deeply, um, also in preparation for meditation. Then we get to meditation. 
So at this point, you're not even concentrating on the mantra, or at least not consciously. Um, you're really just in a state of like, silence and awareness. It's really hard. We try it a lot, and I'm still working on it. And then ultimately, you get to samadhi, which is union with the divine. Uh, so this takes years and years and years of practice. Um, but if you're dedicated over time, you might be able to achieve this for even a minute would be a huge feat. So that's yoga. Simple, right? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Lauren Chamberlain, and today we are giving an education on beer pairings. So I chose to do one um, specifically with Goose Island and kind of theme it through a Belgian uh, style. If you guys didn't know, especially the Matilda and the Sophie and a little bit of the Juliet too were specifically brewed to be paired with um, food. And then the Madame, uh, Madame Rosé is just one of my favorite beers, so I decided to throw that one in there too. But um, we'll be doing a four course meal today. And uh, to start off, we'll be having the Matilda. We'll be uh, pairing it with a certain kind of cheese that's similar to brie. It's called uh, Camembert. And then uh, our second course will be an orange and fennel uh, tossed salad. And we'll be pairing that with Sophie. After that, we'll move into uh, Juliet beer. And we'll be having that with some venison sausage that has this wonderful blackberry jam with it. And to finish off, we'll have the uh, Madame Rosé with a delicious chocolate toy. So, has anybody had the Matilda before? Yeah? What do you guys think? Amazing. Good? Yeah. When you it's taste it, what's the first thing you think of? Full body. Full body? Flavor. Yeah. Okay, well this pairs really well with washed rind cheeses. Um, it's kind of got like an earthy flavor to it a little bit, so when you have cheeses like this, it has like a, uh, kind of pulls out those deep, robust flavors, which is great. Um, it is a Belgian-style pale ale, and um, it, will, it should have kind of like a, a deep yellow um, look to it, and it's, I think they call it Golden Sunrise, but it's a really great beer. Um, and then you should be serving it in a wide mouth glass. Um, for those of you guys who have seen the, the Sophie glasses, you know what I'm talking about. Next, we're going to move on to the Sophie. Have you guys had the Sophie before? Yeah? Yep. Yep. Good. How's it different from the Matilda? Anybody? Yeah. A little sweeter. It's, kind of, it's, got, it's a little bit more crisp. It's a little bit lighter. So when you eat foods and you drink beer, the best way to pair it is you should be drinking and eating something that um, is sort of the same. So if you're drinking a Budweiser, you want to have American food. That's why it goes great with brats. Or if you're having um, a Sophie that's a Belgian, pair it with something that's light, that's, um, that complements the things that it's brewed with. So the Sophie uh, is really great with anything citrusy because it's got kind of an orange peel flavor to it. And then it's really going to um, bring out just like a little hint of um, white pepper and lemon to it too. So that'll be awesome. Um, next, this is really the, the heart and the soul of the meal. This is the Juliet. Uh, this is this one is not out right now, but for those of you who've seen it before, has anybody had it here? No. Um, well, it's another it's another Belgian. It's called a, uh, a wild ale, and it's kind of a um, like a crimson burgundy color, and it's also really great. Um, we're going to be pairing this with a venison sausage. For those of you who don't know what venison is, it's deer, but it's delicious. I promise. Um, it's gourmet, in fact. And we're going to pair it with a um, blackberry reduction. And if the blackberry reduction is coming specifically from Idaho. And for those of you who have been in the mountains before, that's where the best preserves are. And um, the Juliet itself, is, uh, it's got kind of notes of wood and tannin and, uh, and these deep, dark fruits. So I really think this uh, dish will pair well together. And then finally, um, last but certainly not least, uh, the Madame Rosé. Has anybody had it here? No? Yeah? What do you think? Oh, love it. Red like red wine. Yeah, it's delicious. Um, again, like a deep crimson color, and it's got notes of uh, cherry and what's the other one? Um, oh yeah, it's, it's a very malty beer, so it's wonderful. We're gonna have this with a dark chocolate tort and with a uh, again a, a cherry glaze on top, and I think it'll just be the perfect end to the meal. But does anybody have any questions? You guys ready to eat? All right, thanks. What's going on everyone? I'm Alec. Uh, we've introduced ourselves about a thousand times already, so if there's one thing you remember about me that I never shut up about, it's that I'm from Chicago. I love being from Chicago, and I'm really proud to work for AB because they value the Goose Island brand. Uh, Goose Island was established in 1988 by John Hall. 
John Hall was traveling through Europe, sampling all sorts of different beers. And what he came to realize is every region of Europe kind of has its own special local beer. He didn't really feel the same way about the states. Uh, he wanted to go to a city and have a beer that was characteristic of the city he was in. So he went home to Chicago, and coincidentally, on, the, on his flight, it got delayed. And he was reading the Delta Sky magazine about the craft beer industry. And he decided, in his words, probably the first person to ever make a major career decision. He left the container company after 20 years because of an article he read in the Delta Sky in Flight Magazine. That's how Goose Island was born. Located in Chicago, started in 88, moved to a bigger facility in 95, and then was acquired by Anheuser-Busch. Uh, that started in 2011. I believe we bought 58% of it in 2011 directly from Goose Island. And then there's only 42% that was owned by another company that we also acquired, but it wasn't part of the same deal. Um, it is an island in Chicago. A lot of people think it's just some random name. Uh, but we have the Chicago River here, and then this is a canal that they dug. This used to be a really big industrial area, kind of like you have the old defunct Lemp Brewery around the corner. That's what Goose Island is named after in Chicago, is this kind of man-made island. These are the main products that you'll probably be familiar with that are pretty widely distributed throughout the U.S. 312 is their flagship product. 312 is the area code of the city of Chicago. Sorry. Um, why don't we get out of the way? Come over here. Um, it's a crisp wheat ale. Sorry. It's a crisp wheat ale, citrusy, and kind of creamy in your mouth. Um, this is the Honkers Ale. I put the Draftmark uh, logo up because they do make this one in the Draftmark. They actually make all three. I have the IPA in my fridge. Uh, the Honkers Ale is best described as biscuity. Uh, Beer Advocate gives it a little bit better rating than the 312, around an 85, which is pretty good. And then the IPA, as most IPAs are, citrusy, hoppy, really an amazing beer. Let's talk about their influence for a moment. Uh, what John Hall wanted when he started Goose Island was to have a regional beer. This is my hometown, Libertyville, Illinois. I'm from the suburbs, about 30 miles north of Chicago. Their flagship beer is called 847. That's my area code. It's a wheat ale, just like 312. I've had them both side by side. I don't want to say they taste almost the same, but there was clearly a ton of influence from Goose Island in the Chicagoland area and even down to my specific town in an area of 9 million people. These are two of the most common and widely distributed of the four sisters brands that Lauren just talked about. Uh, so I won't go into it too much. What makes Sophie unique and why it gets that little lighter citrusy flavor is actually it's an 80-20 beer. So 20% of it is made from beer that's uh, aged in a wine cask with orange This is the one that I think everyone should know about here. Um, has anybody here had any of the three Bourbon County Stouts? Has anyone had the barley wine? Never had the barley wine? You've had the regular one? The Big John. And have you had the coffee stout? The Big John. I've had that one. No, this is just, it's just called Bourbon County Stout. I've had that as well. I think I've had them all. All right, you've had them all? Yeah. They're amazing. So what makes Bourbon County Stout so unique is it's a stout that's then aged for eight to 12 months and used whiskey barrels. So bourbon barrels have been used for uh, somewhere between eight and 15 years, depending on which barrel it's in. Uh, it picks up, they're also not climate controlled, so the barrels expand and contract with the Chicago weather. So it's kind of like St. Louis, it gets up to 95 degrees and humid in the summer, and then it gets down to about negative 40 in the winter. So these barrels are, are expanding and contracting, that's releasing the flavors of the whiskey. Now. Bourbon County Stout was the first one, the original one, then they made the barley wine. So they took wine barrels, and they took the same stout, said, let's try it in wine barrels. So they made barley wine there. And I think the best one, if you have to choose one of the three to try, they released the coffee stout. So what the coffee flavor does is actually accentuates, accentuates the chocolate malty flavor of the Bourbon County Stout. And that sounds like five minutes. Good job. Hi guys, uh, I'm Clayton Sussman, and uh, being from the TDP program, I thought I'd make some of the compliance training a little bit more real. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about some of these like hacking dangers. 
that uh, are gonna, you're going to see in the compliance training and that are actually going to occur in real life that you probably might be even seen. So first up, I'm talking about social engineering, which according to Wikipedia, is the psychological manipulation of people in performing actions or divulging confidential information. Uh, I don't think I have enough time to go into this video. We'll loop back if we do. Uh, but basically in this video, you see a man call just a security guard at a, at a company, could be AB, and uh, he just starts spouting out information. He spouts out a whole bunch of technical terms. He names some guy that works at the company. He ends up asking for some confidential information that the uh, guard actually knows and ends up giving it to him just because he sounds uh, very credible. Uh, so that's that psychological uh, divulgion, or uh, psychological manipulation rather, and uh, it ends up putting the company at risk. Uh, now a little bit more lower level, we are going to start talking about how you can actually get into somebody's email just using some social engineering techniques. So how many people have seen a screen like this asking you like when you forget your password? Pretty typical. Uh, so you've got like the mother's maiden name, uh, school mascot, some of these seem like, oh, I don't know how anybody would ever figure that out, but actually they're pretty simple. Uh, so if we look at a Facebook page, this is Bobby Boucher, he's a very trusting <laughs> guy. You know, this is his standard Facebook. I found him regular, you can see right here, I haven't even added him as a friend. And already I can see his family over here, so maybe uh, Gwen Maiden, Maiden might be her actual maiden name, I have that information now. Or even, it looks like I'm part of the Parkway Central High School network. So if I go ahead and I Google Parkway Central High School, uh, this is the first result on, on Wikipedia. And if we zoom in a little bit to that far right side, you'll see the mascot is the Colt. So if we go back a little bit to that security question, look at that one at the bottom, I just figured out Bobby's high school mascot. And I can go ahead and get into his email. Now that's extremely dangerous because if you don't fill out one of these sort of forms where you re-enter your password and then the security question, uh, a lot of companies will just and, uh, use as their password reset function, they will send you an email. So using that email address, I can then take over pretty much anything that is linked to his email, like his bank statements or even confidential information here at AB. Uh, so in short with that one, try and uh, make sure that you know what you're actually posting online and if possible opt out of the security questions. Uh, so another sort of hack is phishing and this is more of a targeted response and it's the attempt to acquire sensitive information such as usernames, passwords, and credit card details by masquerading as a trustworthy entity. So again picking on Facebook, uh, you might get an email that looks just like this. And basically it's saying, hey, I need you to update your information for security features. And you go ahead and you click the update button, you click here. It looks like it's coming from facebookemail.com. And you go ahead and you get to this page. Anybody see anything different? That's the point, it's a trick question. It is identical to the page, except for one thing, which is the URL address at the very top. And it's even disguised so that it looks very similar to Facebook. So it's actually facesbook.com.award space. Okay? So it's even disguised to look almost like facebook.com. And so what happens though, if you type in your email and password there, it's actually forwarded to that attacker. And then it might even log you into Facebook so that you don't even know. So be very aware of the URLs that you are clicking on. Make sure that they are actually legitimate. The last one I'm going to talk about is Trojans, and so they're very analogous to the Trojan horse example, uh, disguising it as uh, disguising something as a trustworthy entity, but in the background or in the Trojan horse, there might be attackers laying in wait. Uh, so it's a type of malware program that contains malicious code that, when executed, uh, typically causes left loss or theft of data. So again, one more time with Facebook. Uh, a lot of people see these on uh, Facebook updates saying, you know, check out this video, or maybe they post it directly to your wall, and it looks like a weird URL address, but maybe you're a really trusting person, like, oh, I know this guy, so I'm going to go ahead and click it. And they might bring you to a Facebook video page, but then it'll bring up this pop-up behind me as well. So this is important because this is usually a red flag. If, if it asks you to run something, it's going to need your administrator privileges in order to actually run it. So if you go ahead and you click run, the video might even play. And then a little bit later, you might see this, a antivirus screen. And this is a good thing. Yay, everybody wants uh, antivirus. But in the background, 
This is actually the Trojan at work. And this scanning bar at the bottom is actually how far it's made it through computers searching for confidential documents and such. Uh, so with that, questions, although we don't really have time. Wow. So should we just wow. not use these? Right. <laughs> 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 All right, so I'm Kelly Christian, TDP. I'm here to present avocados. There is no A in fruit, but avocados are fruit. <laughs> Kind of like tomatoes, but not really. Tomatoes are also fruits, if you didn't know. Uh, so avocados are fruits, uh, specifically berries, because of their seed-bearing structure, and also because they come from the ovary of the flowering plant, which basically means they don't come from a root, and they don't come from um, a stem. Also, avocados, I guess they're commonly perceived as vegetables because they're more savory than sweet. Um, that kind of came from the kitchen because chefs decided it's, it's not sweet, so I want to call it a vegetable, basically. <laughs> so does anyone know why the avocado is also called the alligator pear? Because it's green? <laughs> and it has alligator skin on the outside? Exactly. Kind of shape of Yep. So because of its green scaly skin, and because the shape of the avocado actually mimics the head of an alligator. And then also because when you cut it in half, it kind of looks like the eye of an alligator. So this meaty fruit, would you guess, is full of fat. But, good fat. <laughs> it's full of monounsaturated fat, which is really good for reducing heart disease and uh, reducing the risk of stroke. And then it's also full of vitamin E, which I'm sure a lot of us women know it's really good for our skin. A lot of people do avocado masks to basically, someone called it, it's basically a better and cheaper way of doing Botox. <laughs> um, and then I call them magnesium monsters because they are full of magnesium. Um, they're probably one of the top fruits full of magnesium and then it's really good for lowering blood pressure. So let's get into the good part. So when people think of avocados, they mostly think of guacamole, right? You mash it, you get at Mexican restaurants, usually drinking it with tequila or something like Corona. Um, but avocados are really good also on their own, right? Right here, we have a thinly sliced avocado, fresh, probably just a little bit of salt, put on a piece of salmon or put on a piece of bread with some salmon, and it's delicious. But let's mix it up a bit, right? avocado fries. You can actually fry avocado, right? Maybe a little bit of good fat, a little bit of bad fat. It just kind of balances out. You can rationalize that in your head, right? <laughs> um, so then also something different, you know, avocados, you know, really good as a snack. We got fries, we got little pieces of crackers, but avocados for dessert. So you can also have avocado ice cream. Uh, last, or this past Sunday, was actually National Ice Cream Day, so this would have been great. <laughs> Um, so in a nutshell, avocados, you can have them fresh, fried, frozen, they're healthy and versatile, and I suggest you try one or so. Hi, I'm Katie Klepper, and today I'm going to present to you my family. This is only one, one half. This is my dad's side, the Kleppers. My mom is a Roarback, and I actually used made name for security questions, so I got to remember to change that. Um, I'm not going to go through all the people in this list, Oops. just my immediate family. So first, let's start with my dad. This is Michael Klepper, and he is an amazing dad, but I only put his very, very few skills that he has. He's a guitarist. He can play just about any song you ask him to, specifically Beatles, Bob Dylan. Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, he's very cool, very cool. He also loves going to the movies, so um, he loved Maleficent, and he took me and my little brother, and then he took me, my little brother, my little sister again, and then he took my mom, and then he took my older brother. So he's seen that movie like four times in one week. He loves going to the movies. Uh, he's also a huge fan of Disney. We're um, Disney Vacation Club members. And we walked into the park, and my dad sprinted ahead of all of us and was like waving, like, come on, we're at Disney, we're at Disney. He was so excited to be there, and 
He's just, he's a big, he's a big kid. Uh, he's also a beer man, so he has his own distributorship in Northwest Ohio. He runs it with my uncle and my two aunts. Uh, my grandfather started it in 1940, 1946. So he loves the beer business, everything about it, and that has obviously affected me because I'm now in the beer business. So that is um, actually he and I on my 21st birthday. I had my first legal beer with him. It's very exciting. And there he is playing guitar a long time ago to my big brother. Next is my mom, Karen Klepper. And she is also an incredible parent. She's a great role model. She's um, survived through breast cancer and thyroid cancer. She only has one boob, so it's like we always pick on her. Yeah, her breast. Um, so she's also a great cook. She makes anything and everything. She can just throw a bunch of random stuff into a pot. It comes out amazing every single time. She makes great cheesecake. Uh, she's also really, really hard worker. She was raised out in the country, had to work on a farm, and uh, she built her, um, her childhood pond. Like she's just Every, every day is a work day with my mom, basically. There's always something to do at our house, and she likes to put, she likes to get everyone on board for cleaning. It's really great. Next is Tony. Uh, this is my big brother. He and I went to school together. We were in the same grade, even though he's a year older. Um, so there he is. Big brother, that's like, he, he is the epitome of big brother. One time someone was picking on me in school, and he like shoved him up against the locker, and I don't know, he's just a good big brother. He's also an amazing athlete. He, can, he was, I think, second in the state for his, um, I don't know what you would call it, like golf score. Like he, he was, he's really good. He's also an amazing bowler and a great, great baseball player. Um, he's also a really good friend. He's just a really good person. Can't say enough about Tommy. That's, it's kind of creepy that I use this picture of him because it's a senior picture. It looks like I'm obsessed with him because it's very like, he looks like a model. And then that's me and him on our first day of third grade. Next is my little sister, Frankie. She was born after me. And she died when she was two years old. She had a kidney and liver failure. And there she is. Here she is when she, when she was younger. She was a little healthier. And here she is. She gained a lot of weight. You can see the tube. She had to be fed through her nose. She was very, very sick. Um, she died. Yeah, after, like about two years old. So really sad, but she is also a great role model for me because she just survived so much in that two years and pretty incredible. Okay, so next is Monica. She was born after Frankie. She is my best friend. I love her very much. She's a traveler. She's going to Italy, Jamaica, um, and North Carolina all in one summer. She's going to be doing a lot. She's also a great runner. She's really good motivation because she's five years younger than me, but she runs way more than I do. She's very determined. Uh, and finally, my little brother, Matt. This is, he's a lot like my dad. He plays the guitar. My dad is teaching him the guitar. He can play just about anything too now. Uh, he also plays the drums. He's a great golfer as well. Uh, very athletic brothers. And then he also loves making movies. He wants to go into film and pictures of dogs. That's my dog, Bane, Bixie, Charlie, little puppies. So that's, that's my family. Hi everyone, I'm Allison Schwartz and I'm going to talk to you about being a foodie. I'm a really big foodie and I know that term kind of gets thrown out in pop culture and in our society today and a lot of people, um, it kind of goes over their head and they don't even really know what it means. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what it means to be a foodie. Um, okay, so a foodie is someone who is enthusiastic about the preparation and consumption of good food. Um, and they also seek new dining experiences as a hobby. Um, so I love, like on the weekends, Friday and Saturday nights, going and trying new restaurants. Um, I love to try new restaurants. I rarely will go to the same place twice, um, especially for dinner. I love to see what else is out there. And then I